committee's uh, meeting is very special to me and, and supports the land trust. And as you know, we're a, we're a, a nonprofit organization. We rely on donations and volunteers. And we can use as many donations and as many volunteers as we can muster. So uh, and we appreciate all the support from our members. Uh, as you have, uh, many of you may be members. If not, please think about uh, joining. And we're also looking for directors. Because none of us on our board are getting any younger. <laughs> we need some young blood. <laughs> Good shot in the arm for our land trust. Uh, my name is Fred, and I'm going to be uh, taking on the presidency this year. And I'd like to honor our president, or recognize uh, our president, Sue Murray, for the last four years, who's worked really hard and dedicated her, her time and energy uh, to our land trust. Sue, could you come up here, please, sure. for a minute? As I said, Sue's been uh, our president for four years, and she's a little, little brass. <laughs> We're passing the baton here tonight. That's right. Anyway, Fred was nice enough to take over the presidency. In, anyway, um, some of the some of the things that Sue has done in the past four years. One comes to mind is the conservation, the uh, the uh, land trust, Connecticut Land Trust um, Conservation Council. Grant Council grant, yes. the grant that we got. Um, She's worked on the farming, Lower Farmington River uh, and Salmon Brook Wild and Scenic uh, Committee. That's a national uh, wild and scenic river system. Uh, that is uh, for Congress right now, waiting to get passed. Uh, Sue's worked on the nat uh, nat Natural Resource Inventory, NRI. And if you go on our website, you'll see that uh, that's where the uh, land trust, the um, uh, open space maps are, uh, forest coverage, uh, water uh, water coverage maps, all those maps, that's where there's like a dozen maps on there, okay, and, and Sue was instrumental in that. Uh, our uh, Heartland build-out analysis that she worked on, uh, I'm probably forgetting a lot of things, so, you know, you worked on so many the, uh, things. Tom's 10-year plan. Well, yeah, the Tom's 10-year plan. <laughs> and uh, I think we should just yeah. get, get going. But, <laughs> yeah, I'm a little long winded, I'm sorry. Um, so, uh, it, and, and she's brought, you know, she's brought more, elevated our, our uh, organization, uh, it brought more visibility uh, on a state, local, and uh, regional level for our organization. So, uh, so on uh, behalf of the directors, uh, we just took up a little donation, and we'd like to uh, give you this. Well, thank you very it's much. A gift certificate. Appreciate that. And we also have made a uh, donation to our land conservation fund in your name. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Much appreciated. Presentation. We have refreshments, and if you haven't noticed on the, coming in, we have hats and our uh, <clears throat> calendars on sale, and that's those are big fundraiser items for us. And I'd like to thank uh, Carol Vincent. Please stand up, Carol. <laughs> Carol I spent countless hours working on the calendar project, and if you've seen the calendar, it's absolutely gorgeous. All right, and her and her daughter Tracy. And it's pictures of Heartland Wildlife. It's all pictures of Heartland Wildlife, and, it, and there's dates on there for all, a, lot of, a lot of town uh, meetings and whatnot. Uh, it's, it's an excellent product. Uh, so I hope we don't forget anything. Uh, our next fundraiser event will be October 21st, Tuesday, at the, camp, at the uh, Flatbreads uh, in, at the Canton Shops on Route 44 in Canton, flatbread pizza. Uh, they make a donation to our land trust for every pizza they sell that day. We are also gonna be having uh, a silent auction. And 
it's, it's been a very successful fundraising event for us. So if you're down that way on that Tuesday, October 21st, please stop in for pizza. If you can uh, see what we have for gifts on our, on our uh, auction, silent auction, uh, please participate in that. I, I think I've covered everything. Uh, a <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, without any more of my rambling on, I'd like to introduce E.J. Michalski, who's a DEP -E -E fish biologist, to speak about the uh, fisheries in Connecticut and a little bit about the history of fish. He said he's got a 30 minute presentation or an hour and 30 minute presentation. I said, Which one do you want? Oh. <laughs> I get through with you guys. Sorry, you better go. That's my bedtime. You better, you better go with the 30 minute job here, okay? So, and then afterwards, um, we're going to be, uh, we're, we'll listen to Deb Kostalnik uh, with the uh, Salmon in Schools program. And I just found out that that's going on for another year uh, and it's gone into the third grade. And it's the third year going for it, and uh, we'll learn all about that. And that's what I forgot to say. It. Sue pushed for that and was instrumental in getting that through. Another thing that she did. Another thing that she did. <laughs> See, it all comes back. All right, so um, here's EJ. I say we skip this and go to flatbread pizza. <laughs> um, I put this talk together a while ago, um, and kind of the interesting thing, I modified it for tonight, and then put the old version back on the thumb drive, so you're getting the old version, not the modified version. Um, but the uh, when I put this talk together, it really became apparent that there was so much information that actually shaped what, because we all have, we all know about the fish that we have, the freshwater fish, but how did they get here? Um, what mechanisms did they use to get here? Uh, how did some fish end up in some places and not in others? And so tonight we're going to start somewhere in the neighborhood of 500 million years ago and work our way right up to the present. And it's going to jump around a little bit, and it's going to, but it, what, I, what I tried to do was take the most important aspects that both from a geological standpoint and also from uh, right up through early colonial settlement and then all the way to the present and pull out the important parts that actually shape what we have. So if this thing works, we're going to again cover the geological, brief geological history of Connecticut. We're going to look quick at the, uh, the evolution of Connecticut fish populations. Um, and probably the most important thing, um, at least from, with respect from the 1600s to current, the human impacts. We have been the single most important thing that has shaped what we have right now. And we continue to shape what we currently have um, today. And then we'll go into a little bit about the fisheries management aspect and also the, uh, uh, both the current uh, fish management practices that we use and how they've been altered and changed from a historical perspective. And we'll look at some of the environmental threats that we're faced with now. Two of the main geological forces that, that shaped not only our landscape, but ultimately both plants, animals, and, and, our, and what we're talking about tonight, fish populations or fish communities, were plate tectonics and, and the movement of land masses, and then following that, the glacial period, and I liken it to a big Brillo pad because once the um, uh, let's see if this works. Yes. Um, once we went through the period where the uh, uh, Earth plates were moving and it started to form our topography, so we've got the uh, we've got basically four major landscapes in Connecticut the Northwest Highlands and the Southwest Hills on the western side, the Eastern uh, Hills and the Connecticut River Valley, formerly Glacial uh, Lake Hitchcock before it became uh, Riverine, and then everything down in here along the coastal slope are the four main landscapes. It was the plate tectonics that pushed all that up and started to form what we had. And more importantly, not only did it, it Form the topography, but it also set the stage for the productivity of the waters that we have. And we'll get to that in, in a bit. 
Um, within that, we have the major drainage basins um, in Connecticut. There's three major drainage basins, the, uh, the Housatonic, the Connecticut Basin, and the Thames Basin. And then we've got a series of the coastal basins that drain directly down into the uh, um, into Long Island Sound. And there's four of those. And then we've got this one little section over here in the Hudson area. Some of the waters in Connecticut do drain into New York, into the uh, into the Hudson. And this will okay. Now we were talking about productivity. Well, how does plate tectonics and uh, the receding of the glaciers end up um, dictating aquatic uh, life and, and aquatic product productivity. What you can see here is the different underlying rock types on, on <coughs> throughout the state and how in such a small state it differs. Um, we've got in a, in a very small, um, like a two hour drive from one end of the state to the other, you can go from upland areas through the Connecticut River Valley back into upland areas. You've got a whole bunch of different underlying rock, like a rock skin. And, but the, one of the important aspects is this light blue area, which is all up and down the, uh, the western side of the state, and that's the Marble Valley. And that really is the underlying factor why the western portion of the state has such high productivity in their waters and the remainder of the state, while still can support aquatic life, definitely, does not have the same types of systems that we have over here. So if you look at a, uh, the whole Housatonic River Basin, East Twin Lake, Juan Oscopomic, and you were to go out and measure phytoplankton levels and zooplankton, you would see everything, the, the numbers are just through the roof. Um, it has also allowed um, certain things to happen in this area, which we'll get to when we get to talk a little bit about invasive species, that could not happen over here, um, just because of that calcified, uh, or that calcium buffer, the limestone buffer. Um, Next. Some quick facts about Connecticut's uh, resources, and what's really incredible is I think everybody, in, probably everybody in this room, I know myself included, often tend to take for granted what's in our backyard. Um, we talk about the fishing resources in Montana, and Colorado, and all these other places in Alaska. We have tremendous resources right here, and case in point, for such a small such a small state, we have over 425 lakes, ponds, and reservoirs that cover about 56,000 acres, and we have over 6,500 miles of river and stream resources, which for, again, for the size of the state, is actually quite incredible. So, that was just a really, really quick skim over how um, some of those, uh, those uh, geological aspects form Connecticut. <coughs> One thing I should probably touch on a little bit more was the glacial period. And when that receded, um, it, we had all these jagged, not mountains, but hills, and it acted like a big gorilla pad and just cut all that down, rounded everything off, and formed the current, or many, of the, uh, the natural lakes and ponds that we have and also, um, for the most part, the stream courses that we have. So how did fish get into Connecticut waters when you've got, you know, up till about 11,000 or more, more like 12,000 years ago, um, everything was frozen and you have this ice cold water. Well, the three main theories that, uh, that have been, that are proven to be true is that fish migrated into uh, Connecticut's resources via freshwater routes. And we'll talk a little bit more about each one of these. The second was that they were actively transported by humans. We know that happens. That happens every day, um, even currently. People are moving fish around, including us. Um, and also, some fish may have adapted or been adapted uh, from either anadromous or catadromous or saltwater gene pools. Um, so as they move up into freshwater, um, they eventually can form a, uh, an isolated freshwater population. So we're going to take a look at 
those. Now, the ones, hopefully you guys can read this, but trust me, there's 23. If you want to count them, go ahead. But there's 23 and species of fish on that list. Those are the only 23 native fish species that we have in freshwater in Connecticut. Now, anybody that spends any time outdoors knows that we have a lot more than 23 freshwater fish species. And we'll get to where those came from in a minute. But that first theory that we were talking about, about fish migrating in from freshwater roots, um, one thing I did not mention on, and because I, I wanted to mention it here, well, how did they get here? On <coughs> following the glacial period, as the glaciers receded, we have Long Island Sound that cuts across at least now part of um, and uh, a few miles out from the Connecticut coastline. If you were to follow that reef system all the way over and connect it to Rhode Island, um, essentially that was a blocked freshwater lake that they called Glacial Lake Connecticut. On um, Glacial Lake Connecticut, I'm not sure exactly how long that, that was in existence for, but it was enough for these fish, fish species. And there was even some theory that there was a, a, a small stock of fish that was a little further south than that that eventually migrated up into Glacial Lake Connecticut. But as the glaciers receded and the water kept coming down, it actually, if you think of Long Island Sound and that reef system going all the way across as a berm, the water started to rise and come up over that and it actually cut across that berm, allowing now salt water to start to come in. And where this becomes important is when you're looking down this list, most of these fish species occur in all of these drainage basins across the, uh, across the state. But when you start to get down here, you notice that some of these fish species really only occur from the Connecticut River West. And there's a couple down in here, the banded sunfish and the swamp garter, that only occur in the Thames River or further over the east. How did that happen? What most likely happened and why the fish got separated is that as the salt water started to pour into Glacial Lake Connecticut and they started to go up into the freshwaters, if, if the fish species were widely distributed across that whole lake, they had an equal opportunity to go up into the Connecticut River, Thames River, or Housatonic, and all the coastal places. But if they were not equally distributed at that time and the salt water came in, it actually formed a barrier. Now they couldn't get from one side to the other. They only could go up in the fresh waters that they were close to. And at that point, if there was not a direct connection from one basin to the next, they would be isolated in that one spot. And that is how they ended up um, being. Uh, so the Creek Chug and the Cutlips Minnow, which we have in abundance in the west. We, they don't have any east, even though they occur over here in the thing, like in the case of creek chubs, they occur over in the Thames and the Connecticut River. I know from experience that they're very, very few and, and far between, even though they are there. Um, and likewise, these fish here, we do not have them on this side. Um, again, there was no connection for them. If they tried to go back into what was now starting to be Long Island Sound, they would hit the salt water and have to turn around and go back and die because they couldn't get from one, one basin to the next. So 23 fish species, where did all the rest come from? Here's another, I think 28 that We'll jump ahead just a little bit that started to show up somewhere in like that late 1700s, but more during the Industrial Revolution period, the mid 1800s. And we'll go into exactly why that was, but there's 28 fish species on here. And one thing, if you can, if you can see that, you'll start to see that a lot more of the like Northern Pike Channel catfish, um, bluegill sunfish, smallmouth bass, largemouth bass, all of the other salmonids that we have, the trout, other than the one brook trout, which is our own and only native uh, trout, but it's even not really a trout, it's a char. And, but all, all of these um, game fish that we think of as being important today, especially for, for fishermen, um, they didn't come anywhere from, uh, from natural roots. Uh, and when I say roots, you know, the freshwater roots. But it's not done there. Here's another complete list of 
fish species that have been transported in by humans, and only two of which, the long-nosed sucker, um, and I'll explain the 1991 in a second, and the tench, which is a large European minnow that were brought in. Those two species, the long-nosed sucker and the tench, we have recently identified as having thriving populations in some places in Connecticut, the tench especially. Um, we found, we knew there was a lake in Plymouth where somebody had introduced tench, who knows when. They ended up in Bantam Lake. Bantam Lake is basically paved with tench. Why is that important to us? Um, it, if you think of a, a body of water, whether it's a river, um, stream, or especially a lake or pond, it can only support just so much biomass of fish flush. Um, and it's either in balance, where you have forage fish and predatory fish that, that strike a balance with one another, or in the case of something like an, inter an introduced species, even if it isn't invasive, when you put a, a generally introduce a species into a, a, a body of water, or, or even if it's an animal or a plant, it tends to take over for a period, of, at least a period of time, if not indefinitely. And the tench have definitely done that. And we don't know at this point how that's going to affect Bantam Lake and the ultimate uh, uh, remaining fisheries in Bantam Lake. But uh, the long nosed sucker we found in the Cockpot River about. 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and there was multiple age classes, and now we can't find them again, but we know they're there, or at least we suspect they're there somewhere. Um, and still more. Some of these fish were the ones that migrate into um, uh, the anatomous fish, um, and catatomous fish that have migrated into um, uh, freshwater. The anatomous and catatomous fish require as part of their life cycle, some interaction with fresh water, whether it's spawning in fresh water or whether they come back like an eel, where they spawn in salt and then come back to fresh water and live out part of their life cycle and then go back again. Um, but others, like the, uh, the white perch, uh, the rainbow smelt, um, both of those have, uh, and allies, um, all three of those have established populations in Connecticut that are strictly fresh water. They still have their uh, um, anadromous uh, cohorts in the, uh, in the salt, but we have, um, uh, we have those three populations that are, that are established, or three fish that are established. And there's still more. Another 71 species of saltwater fish, some of which may have actually, at one point or another, developed a freshwater population. I did promise I was going to do this in 30 minutes, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> We're on the hour in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, now, what, um, actually, let me back up one. The, uh, I think I missed one. I did. Um, so the distribution of freshwater fish um, is something that is constantly, constantly changing um, and has been and always will. But the single most important aspect to the changes that we, uh, that I think have been, has been the uh, biggest influence and had the biggest impacts is us. Human impacts. Um, the, we have had, um, like I said, and currently still to this day, we, uh, um, we constantly are monkeying around with, with the resources that we have, and some are good, some are not. Um, but starting back with the, uh, the colonial settlement period, um, back in the 1600s, they came to this, um, you know, they came to this, this country and they started to forge a new life. And the resources were something that was considered, in some cases, an adversary, and something that they needed to control and adapt for their purpose. Um, so even as far um, as long ago as the late 1600s, early 1700s, even though they did not, they didn't care about conservation. They didn't want to document what was here. Um, they started to manipulate it for their purposes, mostly for food. 
Um, and they also use the waterways for sources of transportation, for irrigation, and it just, it, and as we'll see, it, it just keeps snowballing. Um, and the shaded area is getting into the, um, the 1600s period, the mid 1600s, late 1600s. So what that is, is the colonial developer, the colonial settlement at that time. So you can see with the Connecticut River Valley, rich in soil for agriculture. Um, they, they managed to, uh, the colonists were able to get up through this Connecticut River Valley quite easily, um, because largely because of the Connecticut River. And they were able to, to colonize this quite well. Um, and all through the coastal slope as well. But you notice that the eastern uplands and western, um, not so much. And one of the major reasons for that was interactions with Native Americans at that time. And it was essentially a, uh, uh, somewhat of a, uh, a war zone going on. And by the late 1700s, the colonists had been pretty widespread throughout Connecticut, um, and including the upland area. But the waterways were now being used, because now there's more and more people. They had to feed themselves, they had to irrigate crops, and so now we start seeing small dams to divert water. The dams become very important in a little bit. Um, they needed those dams to power mills, um, irrigate the, uh, the crops, but there's even more. Railroads, more dams, more industry, more people. And it all started to lead to uh, that industrial revolution where you're starting to get increased water temperature, deforestation. If you ever looked at old photographs, aerial photographs of Connecticut, we are way better off now than we were 200 years ago, 150 years ago, because um, not only because of the Clean Water Act, but also, um, well, there's been a change in, in attitude uh, is one, but the, uh, you know, I think a lot more people now are environmentally conscious where back then it was just they needed to survive. And so all these changes really started to affect fish species throughout Connecticut. Um, and remember, we're not even into, uh, really into the 1800s yet. Getting into the 1800s because of the dams and overfishing, um, Atlantic salmon were all but gone in the Housatonic River Basin. They were also largely gone from, uh, well, by the mid 1800s, they were gone from the, Hoos or, uh, the Connecticut, uh, or seriously declined in the Connecticut River Basin and also in the Thames. American shad, same thing. Populations were collapsing rapidly. Brook trout, very, very sensitive to certain things, pollution and temperature change. And once you started to deforest everything and more pollutants came into the waterways, brook trout started, populations started to decline. Believe it or not, some of our wild brook trout populations are much stronger now and found throughout more areas in Connecticut than they were at that, at back, uh, again, 200 years ago. So to counteract this, People started taking an interest in, uh, there were self-taught ichthyologists, people that were studying fish, biologists, and there was also starting to become university trained uh, ichthyologists, and so they started to look into fish culture. And again, it wasn't so much for the, uh, wasn't so much for the environment because they felt bad that fish populations were declining. It was for them. It was for the best, uh, to serve the people as best they could. And what they started to do was raise fish and develop hatcheries, um, <coughs> which I think there were, historically, there were eight state hatcheries in Connecticut uh, starting in the uh, late 1800s. And um, uh, now there's three. Um, but they started to raise it not only for consumption, but also to manipulate the wild populations that were disappearing. Um, some, some facts about the, uh, the time period. Um, as I said, there were some people that were starting to take notice of what we actually had for wild or for natural uh, uh, resources. And, the, uh, uh, and with this came a little bit of a change in attitude 
where they started to realize they needed to maybe protect some of these things before they all disappeared. And the uh, Connecticut Fisheries Commission was formed in, in 1866. Um, while they were formed to, um, uh, to take responsibility for the resources, uh, still the overlying attitude was this, the to best serve, manipulate fish to best serve the needs of the people. They still haven't gotten to that more holistic approach of uh, fully understanding what, uh, what they were doing. So we started to see fishing regulations show up. The first regulation was in 1871, set by the uh, Connecticut Fisheries Commission. And the second one was interesting um, to me, was, and if you read through that, and anybody who trout fishes understands what April 15th is, although it's, it's been changed a little bit, our opening day of trout season, or fishing season, starts the third Saturday of April. And that stemmed all the way back from 1876, where they declared April 15th as the start of, of trout season. A um, couple other things there. So regulations uh, where they had a uh, brook trout incentive program, um, and that was, I think they just felt bad because they were, they were wiping out brook trout populations, so they thought if they domesticated them, they could stock them back in. Um, and we realize now that doesn't work. Um, different genetics. Uh, gear types were starting to be regulated, so the types of fishing gear you could use. And this was interesting. By the turn of the century, the commission began to enact pollution control measures. Um, so as early as uh, beginning of the 1900s, um, they already started to realize that things were, were, were not going well. So some of the hatchery, a uh, little bit of information on the hatcheries in Connecticut. Um, the first was in 1899 in Windsor Locks. Um, and most of this is kind of what we talked about. But you notice that the first brown trout and rainbow trout came in the, uh, the 1890s. Br uh, brown trout all came from Europe. They were not in the United States at all. Um, rainbow trout were, but they were out west. They were transported. Um, and again, we had at least eight that I could find, eight state hatcheries at, at one point. And now we are down to three. So the current fish management um, and some of the environmental threats that we're faced with at this point. Fish stocking, we still do it. Um, we have since the 1800s and we still do it. Um, but up until, and I should probably change that because that 1960s is not, not exactly the right number. I think it's more in the 1970s, even early 1980s before we started to change our attitude towards stocking. And most of the, the, the time, um, fisheries managers and biologists just put them out there. And with no regard for how are the genetics being influenced in the, uh, the waters. How, how, so if we put brook trout from a hatchery on top of brook, wild brook trout populations to manipulate them, was that good? Was it bad? They didn't really pay attention to it, they just did it, thinking it was going to work. Um, and again, we know now that that doesn't. What about stocking uh, northern pike in a lake? Um, not always a, uh, a bad thing by any means. We, we currently manage them. Um, but what are the effects on the other fish populations? One thing I didn't mention earlier, and I should have, was the introduced fish species. Um, and when they, when, when they started to bring all those fish species from Europe and get them from other areas and bring them in. If you look at most of our, especially our large bodies of water, and anybody, anybody here fish other than me? There's a few. The, um, you know, when you go out, largemouth bass are almost everywhere in most ponds, they're all introduced. Most fish species that I would say outnumber all native species are introduced in all of our large bodies of water and some of our smaller ones too. And that's not just Connecticut, that's nationwide. Um, and it's just the, uh, the nature of, a, of an introduced animal, plant, or fish taking hold and, and running them up. Um, 
So I mentioned the holistic approach before, and what I, what I, I don't know if I explained that, but what I mean by that is we tend to look more from an environmental standpoint and we manage things more on a watershed basis or on an ecosystem basis. What are the impacts that are, that are, that are, that we are, are we going to have on it if we manipulate a fish population or if we change the habitat? How is it not just going to affect that body of water, but what about waters downstream from it? Developmental pressures. A huge thing that we are faced with on currently, and even though, like I said, our waterways are in much, much better shape than they were a couple hundred years ago, on a daily basis, um, you can see something like this. I'll actually come back to this slide for a second. Or on your way to work in the morning, you can see something like that. Um, believe it or not, we actually were going out on a sample that day, and we were sampling this stream further up and uh, also another stream in the area. This is Fully Mill Brook in Naugatuck. The Naugatuck River is right here. This is an unbelievable cold trout stream right in the middle of Naugatuck. It's actually one of my long-term reference streams. I monitor temperature in this year around, and then periodically we monitor fish populations so that we can, uh, we can look at this happens to be a very, very cold, cold stream. We can look at cold streams, cool streams, and warm streams throughout Connecticut, and it's going to be a way where we can actually monitor changes possibly from climate change. Um, but it's going to take decades to get enough information for that. But we stopped to see where we were going to sample that day and looked off the bridge, and somebody had driven this gigantic piece of equipment into the, the middle of the stream. And they were actually doing some, some work down in there. And we found out later that they weren't permitted for this yet. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, but anyway, just jumping back to this, um, the, uh, obviously with the developmental pressures, the loss of habitat is the biggest thing. Loss of habitat is huge. We still have more and more people. Our population is increasing. People need houses. Every time we build something, it changes something else. Um, that's why even some of our wildlife, wildlife populations, um, you're seeing a tremendous shift in some of the species that we have, especially not just the number of species, but the, the number of each individual in that particular species. Something like bobcats. We didn't have bobcats at all um, 30, 40 years ago. They're everywhere now. Um, and that is largely due to habitat changes that we have created. Um, but all this other stuff, uh, loss of uh, riparian vegetation, um, so anything on a stream bank or, or a lake bank that used to provide shade, gone. Um, all the non-point source pollution, this one is a big one, impervious surface runoff. We don't think about it, but your roof lines, impervious surface, water goes off it goes off if it doesn't go into your lawn and it gets out on the road, now it's on a tarred surface or a, any kind of a, uh, an improved surface, ends up in a stream. If you get to a percentage, let's say um, we're looking at a, a, a township and about 12% of that township is impervious surface, fish populations are destroyed, um, largely destroyed. Um, can they rebound? Yes, there are, there are things that you can do to, um, to get the habitat back, and that's currently being done, but it's a huge threat. Invasive species, anybody know what these guys are? Zebra mussels. Zebra mussels. Yep, mussels. Um, these first showed up in East Twin Lake uh, up in Salisbury in uh, the early 90s, um, they were doing some weed harvesting and somebody just happened to see a little mussel on a plant, a little teeny teeny thing. And they brought it in and, and lo and behold, it was a zebra mussel. Five years later, I actually dove that lake. Um, we were diving transects and I went down um, uh, about 30, 35 feet, wiped the, the fog off my mask and couldn't believe what I saw. Everywhere, the entire bottom was just Cake with zebra mussels in five year a five year period. You could take your hand and scoop it up, and I did. And brought up a whole bunch of just uh, rooted aquatic vegetation, and there was probably 500 little zebra mussels in there. Just from that one introduction, could have been by a bird, could have been in somebody's boat. Um, who knows how it got there? But just from that introduction, and remember that slide a long time ago about the Marble Valley. 
that's what these guys need to build their, uh, they need the calcium to build their shells. That's why these would not, there's really no threat of them over on the eastern side of the state or in the Connecticut River. Mm -hmm. But on our side out here in the west, very, very much a threat. Um, and with that kind of number of zebra mussels paving the bottom, East Twin Lake became like, uh, looked like gin. Um, crystal clear in just a few years. And they could filter the entire water volume um, in a very, very short period of time. And so, and then we did talk a little bit about the, uh, how introduced species dominate most of the systems once they're put in. Great little creature, an owl life. Um, mm -hmm. Natural, um, <clears throat> you know, they, uh, uh, something that uh, was, from the anadromous stocks that came in. But now that they got here, we started moving them around. I went through the district files and found 27 lakes where biologists moved these into the lakes to provide forage for, mainly for chain pickerel, our one and only native mm -hmm. pickerel, um, part, of, or part of the Asasid family. They moved these guys around. Great forage. We even in lakes that we have when we try to manage some of our trout management lakes because of these fish. However, they also can just create havoc. Uh, Lake Waramog is an example, um, one example, because they feed so heavily on the zooplankton. The zooplankton aren't eating the phytoplankton, so when you go to Lake Waramog in the, in the uh, summertime and it's pea soup green, they're why? One of the reasons why. Um, so, Plants, Eurasian milfoil, another another big one that can take over when it gets in, and one of my favorites. Anybody know what that is? Dino. Dino. Oh. Rock snot. Um, that's about as good as I can get. The uh, and how close is that to where we are right now? It's in Riverton. Yep, it's right in Riverton. Just above where the Still River um, comes into the Farmington. Um, now, it does sound from uh, the people that I've talked to that have been, been monitoring it that uh, they haven't found it you know, much further downstream. Um, so maybe it'll stay isolated there. But this is the type of thing that if you wade in there with felt soles and didn't know that you had been stepping all over it, now it's clinging to your waders and you go home and then you, your waders are still wet and you decide to go fishing somewhere else in the afternoon mm. um, without cleaning them off. <coughs> We've now just effectively transported that somewhere where we really don't, we don't want it anywhere. But, so what's changed over time? Some of it we've already talked about and I kind of touched on this earlier, environmental consciousness. Even though I strongly feel that there's so many people that, that are they are environmentally conscious now, but the one thing that, that I don't like about it is that so many people seem to view our resources as a museum. Don't go touch it. There's ticks out there. Good Lord, don't go in the woods. Just look at it from a safe distance. But nevertheless, they are more engaged than they used to be, and that is a good thing. So more people actually understand um, at least try to understand what's good, what's bad, what can we, and more people are getting involved, what can we do to change it? Um, we mentioned the Clean Waters Act, but there's other restoration efforts that have really helped to improve a lot of our large rivers and streams. Um, and then this here, and you worked on the Natural Resources Inventory for Heartland. I did the same thing in Norfolk. It's a great process. Um, daunting process when you get into it. How many years did you have to do? It was about three, three oh, years. We got you beat. We were at least five. <laughs> and the, uh, uh, but all of that is important because then you get that documentation out to the, the people in town and they realize, wow, we actually, I've never been to that tree or I've never been to that stream. And it's important. And I think that's what's really, really changing. From a fisherman's standpoint, angler attitudes. 
Um, we do have less licensed anglers than we ever used to, but the ones that we do have are more avid and they're more vocal and they want to protect the resources that, that we do have currently. And they're great allies in most cases as far as, um, as, far as protecting the resources. Um, one shift that we've seen, and it's interesting, just doing some uh, uh, work with a, a local fishing club um, and watching how I look at things on a statewide basis in the, in the attitudes of the anglers, and it's real interesting, this fishing club mirrors exactly what we see elsewhere, and it's just this little group of people. And where catch and release versus harvest, well, I think that harvest is still very important in certain areas. Uh, most people are just self-imposed catch and release. It's a great thing for, in, in most cases. Um, the technological advances for anglers, we can't keep up with them. As fish managers, I cannot stay on top of what these guys have to work with when they go out. Before, you may not have had a fish finder if you did, it was rudimentary. And East Twin Lake, a big lake, um, pick any lake, Candlewood Lake is even better, 5,000 acres, our biggest, one of our biggest um, uh, resources we had. And it would take years to learn how to fish that lake or, again, East Twin or some of the big ones. Now, with this and with the information age with computers, can narrow it down to a puddle in no time and go out and target whatever you want and, and you would never have even had to put a boat or, or put on a pair of waders and ever been there before and it's all right there for you um, at your, uh, for your convenience. But that's something that we battle, um, battle against, or not against, but trying to stay on top of that uh, from a management standpoint. Um, and there's been a shift. Trout used to be the biggest thing that we, we had in, in the state. It's still really important, but they're starting, more and more people are starting to switch to species like bass, pike, and walleye as far as fishing. It makes it a little bit different for us as managers. So what's on the horizon? Um, even though a lot of our stuff is improving, um, developmental pressures are still one of the biggest threats on um, invasive species. Um, is still a huge thing. Because we are more global now, mm -hmm. it's not uncommon to have a guy fishing on uh, Thursday and Friday in the Great Lakes and then be down here on Friday or on Saturday and Sunday, same boat, may or may not have washed it off and is in one of our lakes and that's how a lot of that stuff gets transported. Um, and from my standpoint, from a management standpoint, and this is something that I touched on before, we're starting to move away from that single species management type approach to more of an ecosystem uh, strategy. And there's a lot of other things that we've uh, uh, really embarked on over the last, I would say, two to three years. Um, something from like a, a town perspective that I wanna try to get that information out is we're doing a stream crossing assessment um, which I'm sure a lot of people may have heard about start a big thing in Massachusetts and the upper Farmington River uh, drainage. And we have been in contact with them uh, a lot as of late. And we're going to um, honestly document every single stream crossing throughout the entire state. We've already got about, I think, 3,500 crossings done in the eastern part. And we're just getting started out here in the west. And the reason that's important is habitat, habitat segmentation or, or segmentation. Um, if you can't have, if you have brook trout on this side of the culvert, but they can't get through the culvert to get to all that good stuff on the other side, what can we do to that culvert to make it, make it better? Um, it's not all going to change over time. The first part is just inventorying and everything. So I don't know how I did on time. Uh, we were more on the hour long talk, I guess. Um, but if anybody has any questions, now would be great. You mentioned trout being actually Arctic charm. Mm -hmm. Is that, what's that about? It's just genetics. Um, if you trace the genetics back, mm -hmm. um, brook trout are closely, more closely related to char, which is a, a char is actually a fish all into itself in the, uh, uh, um, in the north. Um, 
the, uh, than they are related to the other species of trout, like brown trout, uh, rainbow trout. Uh, they're not as closely related. They're, they the are a char. The brookies. The brookies. Okay. Yep. But, but is the char a native? Not to here. We don't have the uh, uh, brook trout are our char. Okay. They are a char. They're not actually a trout, even though we call them trout. Oh, okay. um, they really aren't a trout at all. They're a char. But, but our brookies are native to yes. this area. Yes. <coughs> There are one and only native mm -hmm. trout for a child. Did I understand you to say there's walleye here? What's that? There's walleye here in Connecticut? Yes, we, um, we did introduce walleye, uh, gosh, back, I think it was around 93, 92, 93, somewhere in that range. And in that particular case, when we brought them in, uh, we were looking at ways to exploit the outlet populations um, in certain areas where, um, you know, uh, outlets are more pelagic, so they're out in the, the open water. Bass, you know, while they do go out there, that's not where they normally feed, so they were not feeding on the outlets. And so you have this gigantic forage base, and nothing was really utilizing them, so that's when we started bringing walleye in, and we started bringing them in just from, a, from an angler's perspective perspective. Before we did that, um, with any introduction that we do now, we go through in a complete, uh, uh, basically it's an environmental impact statement um, that we try to determine, first we measure everything that's in there, we inventory everything, we determine the growth of all the fish species that are in there and the abundance of them, so that when we do introduce a fish, we can, we can check to see if there are any uh, noticeable changes. And in the case of walleye, um, they cannot naturally reproduce if they're feeding on alive. So if we notice that there was a detrimental thing, we could pull the plug and not put them in anymore. And they, uh, uh, and they would eventually disappear because they can't reproduce. Um, there's a certain enzyme in the alive flesh that renders the, uh, the outside of the egg. Um, okay. Did I see some? I just at a point is the you know, recently was changed designation is the Sandy Brook. The still dumps into the Sandy Brook, and the Sandy Brook dumps into the farming. Run that by me again. Is it's no longer the still that goes into the farming tank at Riverton? It's Sandy Brook. They did really? The Corps of Engineers, yeah, if you look that up. They, right, changed, they actually changed the designation yeah, of that short did. stretch? Yeah, Roger, back me up. Ah. Uh, remember we had that conversation? Yeah. Did they I change? didn't even know that. So if you look at that, which is very interesting, I know. Mm. Okay. When, when did that change occur? In the last, uh, pretty recently, in the last year, year and a half, and I believe it was the core, and it determined that Sandy Brook was larger than the still. Well, that would be how, yeah, the yeah, size of the tributary was coming in. It designated as a brook mm -hmm. as opposed to a river, but that's what they were doing. Oh, so that's that interesting. Was, so okay. Check that out. My point? Okay. Were there any um, studies done after the uh, big storms like Sandy and Irene as to uh, changes in fish populations in the streams? Not that, that we did, um, at least nothing that I was involved with. I don't know if the uh, uh, the Adamus <coughs> folks um, were doing, but I didn't hear of anything, so I, honestly I don't know. Um, I don't think there was. Yeah. A lot of those, I mean, some of those changes, um, they could be so localized mm -hmm. that it would be so hard because we can only just sample, uh, you know, a number of areas in a, in a given time frame, and there could be a change that we would just never pick up on. Mm -hmm. um, that would be very difficult to do unless it was a planned thing. Um, but not that I know of. I don't think there was anything done. But in general. Probably well, it would it would if it would if it changed their habitat. Right. But the the fish themselves, um, what we think is catastrophic when they're in a the water uh, environment, um, not to them. And you know you look at what uh, um, 
you know, coastal fish, uh, let's say the striped bass goes through just a feed. Um, it, you and I couldn't swim through that if we tried. And they just, they're feeding and, and it, it's no, uh, no big deal for them. Now the habitat, the local habitat, if that changes, right. that could ultimately change, if nothing else, the distribution of the fish in that area mm -hmm. because they can either no longer use it, or the food source is gone, um, plant life might be gone, um, and it could knock out maybe a nursery area for juvenile fish or something like that. Um, but again, those things would be really tough to manage. I was just talking to some uh, fishermen, uh, the club on the Salmon Brook, mm -hmm. and um, they were saying how difficult it was to get to some of the areas where they would normally fish, and you can't get through the streams, and uh, there's trees all over and that type That's of thing. That's a good thing. Yeah, I know. <laughs> That's a good thing. Anytime a tree falls in the water, I love it, and everybody else wants to take a chainsaw and cut it out, and the, uh, but it's the best thing we've got. Right, right. So. <laughs> Yeah, quick question. It, just picking the Farmington as an example. Mm -hmm. um, over the course of a fishing season, you know, you, you guys will stock it, you know, before season and, you know, maybe periodically. Periodically, yep. But uh, is the fish population, is the stocking replacing, I'll say just for talking purposes, 10% of the fish population, 90% of the fish population? What does a typical profile look like? Um, so when you're all said and done, you know, how many of the native certain fish are still there? Well, what's interesting, interesting and so we'll use the Farmington as an example, and I, I don't know the percentage that we're, um, we're replacing. And one thing I can say is that um, with respect to, to I can, we can't call them wild, well, we can't call them wild fish, but I'll, what I'll call them is uh, naturally uh, reproducing fish. So brown trout, in the case of the Farmington River. Uh, any brook trout in the Farmington River, with the exception of a few localized areas, are not wild brook trout, they're stock. Um, but brown trout, on the other hand, um, the wild population or the naturally reproducing population is exploding in the Farmington, especially in the upper Farmington. Um, in fact, we just sampled down there uh, two weeks ago, and we were collecting broodstock fish for the survivor program, um, which we've been finding uh, genetically this the, uh, the fish that we are selecting out of our, uh, especially the Farmington River, are really well uh, suited and adapted to uh, the current uh, environment in Connecticut. Now, as far as just the overall stocking, um, how much of a percentage do we replace? I'm assuming you're asking, so if the fishermen take out 50%, uh, do we know that? And are we trying to put that 50% back? Yeah. To some degree. We know how much, uh, just we, we can't measure it every year. It's, it's such an undertaking to try to determine how many fishermen, or how many angler hours are, are occurring that the, uh, and we know what the catch rate is, and we have a pretty good idea based on our angler surveys what the harvest is. We do try to replace a percentage of that, but we're never going to replace it one to one. Um, and I think if we were undershooting it too far, um, we would hear about it because fishing uh, catch rates would just start to decline. So we try to maintain and. We, the way we determine that, um, uh, what we need to stock to maintain those, uh, those numbers is one, through angler surveys, again, to know what's going on, and two, through our biological surveys when we're out electrofishing the river to determine how many fish are really there. So, better let Deb do her thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, EJ.
so that we don't have to hear it twice in the interest of time. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Deb Kostalnik. I teach middle school science here in Heartland. I've been here for six years. Uh, this year, Cece Kendrick, Mrs. Kendrick, is teaching sixth grade science, and she co-taught sixth grade with me last year. So we're really looking forward to a great year again together. Um, I want to touch on a little bit about the history of the salmon program. Uh, oops, keep going. Talk about salmon and its life cycle for those of you who aren't familiar with salmon. And I am not a fish biologist, so I'll defer any really complicated questions to our other speaker. I'm done. Uh, <laughs> a brief history of what has happened to salmon in New England, and then a quick overview of our program and why we do it and how it relates to our curriculum. Um, if you didn't pick up a quiz, you should take one on your way out and make sure you get all the answers correct. There is one on the table. Um, what are Atlantic salmon? Okay, uh, if you've never seen pictures of them or anybody catching them, uh, there can be pretty darn big fish. Uh, scientific name is Salmo Salar, which is, well, means a leaper or a jumper if you look at the translation. Okay. They can get uh, quite large. They're an anadromous fish, which means that they um, spend uh, most of their life at sea, they're born in fresh water, they spend most of their life at sea, and then they return to fresh water to spawn. Uh, the picture up there is showing a, a nice size adult. They can get up to about 30 inches or 71 to 76 centimeters if you're a scientist and you like using the metric system, um, or about 5 kilograms. Let's talk about the life cycle quickly. If you uh, think about uh, the adult that we just saw, they, uh, they do come up to fresh water to spawn. And what's really important about the salmon um, is they need to find a, a gravelly stream bed, and they are a cold water species in terms of spawning. This gravel is very important when they lay their eggs because uh, that allows a lot of the oxygen to move through and to make sure that those eggs um, are well oxygenated and also that's good camouflage for the eggs. So we, the change in the riverbeds, the streambeds over time, was, as we talked a little bit about that, a lot of the human activities have really altered the streambeds, which is why we don't have nearly as many salmon as we used to. So the salmon will come upstream, and they will build a nest in the gravel called a red, that's R-E-D-D, -D, and they'll build that with their tail, and then lay the eggs. Um, the eggs are then fertilized by the male, so they are fertilized externally. Um, they will sit in that stream bed in that gravel of the winter, and they will, in midwinter, they will hatch into um, alvin. And uh, they have a food sack here, which I'll show some great pictures of. Then they develop into fry, where they lose that sack, ultimately into par, and then smolt. And then uh, the adult again, and the cycle starts over. So here's some good pictures showing you um, what the eggs look like in the stream bed. And again, that, that gravelly stream bed is really key for the development of those, of those eggs. Um, this picture here has been taken from probably a hatchery or something. It's on a sandy bottom. And there you can actually see the eggs the, with the little eyes of the fish inside, which is really cool. Um, the alvin or sack fry their nickname when they first hatch, and that yolk sac provides the food source because it's too early for insects and plankton in the water, and so they need something to eat, so that sac uh, gives them the nourishment. And um, by spring, they are now matured into fry, and the sac is gone, and now they are ready to actually eat real food. This is the stage at which we will release them into the Farmington River, which I'll talk about in a little further ahead. Um, from that point, they develop into par, and you'll notice the vertical stripes. And so the, that's very uh, helpful for them in terms of camouflage. They uh, always makes me sad when we release them, and we realize that the trout have just been released a couple weeks before that. And uh, we really worry about how many actually make it. <laughs> um, so then they start undergoing a very interesting transformation called smultification as they develop into these smolts. And you'll notice that beautiful silvery color. And this is where the, the, uh, the fish is going under, undergoing physiological changes. It is actually uh, getting ready to live in a saltwater environment. So as they're moving downstream from the Connecticut River down towards Long Island Sound, which is an estuary, which is where fresh water and salt water meet, the salinity of the water is now increased. It's not totally fresh. It's not totally salt. And they're undergoing this transformation. 
at this point in time when they're small and they're heading down this river, they also undergo something called imprinting, which is where they are um, somehow sensing their home stream, and that is how they make their way back. At least that's what scientists think at the current time. Uh, once they make their way into the uh, Atlantic, as a young adult, okay, they actually migrate all the way up here to between Greenland and Canada. There are other species that come from Europe. And uh, there's very complicated DNA studies about which strains have come from where, which I won't bore you with, but it's pretty cool if you're interested in that, in that part of the biology. So eventually, after about two years, uh, some do return after a year, but most after about two years or maybe more after they've um, ate, uh, fattened up quite a bit, um, here's a female salmon uh, returning back to, uh, back to the home stream hopefully the Connecticut River, to start all over again the life cycle. So um, the numbers are, are pretty amazing, and not in a good way. You think about a large female will lay about 8,000 eggs in its, in its red. Okay. About half of them will make it to Alvin. That's a little sack prize. Okay, then we have the fry, then we 200 will be par, about 50 smolt, and down to about two. And of that 8,000 actually make their way all the way back as a returning adult. So, um, kind of sad when you think about it, but that's, that's the reality of it. You know, that's, that's just the way it is. That's nature. Uh, so, quickly looking at the historical range, uh, this is showing you in New England the Atlantic salmon, um, all the tributaries and major rivers that historically had salmon. And they were plentiful all the way up the Connecticut River, all the way up into Vermont, uh, all the way up through Maine, even uh, somewhat into the Hudson I was doing some reading about. So they were very, very widespread. And then, again, talking about the history, what happened? Well, people happened, OK? The 1700s, 1800s, dams were built, uh, pollution, overfishing, all those wonderful things that humans do when they move into an area and attack the environment. Um, and the, as the dams were built, the salmon could not migrate upstream, and even if they tried to do fish waves or whatever to allow the, the fish to get over those dams, once you dam something, the water on the downstream side is no longer gravelly. It's slow moving, and it's sandy bottoms, and it's not an appropriate habitat for the salmon. So by 1810, just about all of the salmon had disappeared from the Connecticut River, which is pretty sad. And supposedly only the Penobscot River in Maine right now has a really good returning population. So if you look at the present distribution, um, much fewer rivers and tributaries. And there's a little note here about how um, in Connecticut they tried for a long time for, to restore salmon, and it just hasn't been successful. Um, so what happened? Well, restoration attempts were made in the 1800s that didn't really work very well. Um, in, the 19, in 1965, people started, environmental awareness started, people were like, hey, what's going on? Why are there no fish? Uh, dams were changed in terms of the ways that the salmon could get around them. The restocking um, efforts started. In 1996, the Salmon in Schools program was started by the Connecticut River Salmon Association. And they are the ones that sponsor the program here in our school. Um, and despite these restoration efforts that have been going on for quite a while, the salmon population um, has not recovered. It's not anywhere near where it was. And in 2012, after Hurricane Irene, a large hatchery in Vermont, which uh, supplied most of New England and did help out Connecticut also, was destroyed. And with that and a lot of other issues, the Fish and Wildlife Service said that they were not going to um, back the um, salmon restoration efforts here in New England and further, which was really sad. So the program was kind of revamped, and now we have something called a legacy program, the Salmon Legacy Program. And at one point in time, uh, several million salmon were stocked annually. Now we're down to about 200 to 250,000 in the Connecticut River. So that's pretty sad. So what is a Salmon Legacy Program? Really just to preserve the heritage species, to allow some genetic diversity, um, to allow education. The Salmon in Schools program involves 65 schools and about 12,000 students. So it touches a lot of people here in Connecticut. Um, support research, support fishing, 
Um, and really let salmon be a, a signal <coughs> species to really tell us environmentally what's going on, although we have a pretty good handle on how bad it is, unfortunately. Um, so what is the program? The program started in Heartland. We've done it for two years. This is our third year. Um, we get the eggs delivered in, uh, in the fall, and they hatch around late January, early February. We monitor and keep the temperature constant, let the kids peek in the tank about once a week so they don't disturb them because they need to be in this cold, dark water. Mm -hmm. And then we release them in late April or early May um, when the habitat is suitable for them when there'll be insects out and when their sack has been totally consumed. Um, thanks to a grant from the Farmington River Coordinating Committee, we will be expanding the program this year to the third grade, so we'll have two tanks, which we're really excited about. And of course, the Heartland Land Trust supports us with Supplies and stock out day. Wouldn't be able to get those fish there without Harold and Alana helping me, so thank you to those. <laughs> okay, so just quickly, um, the, the tank needs to stay extremely cold. Um, it needs to stay just a little bit above freezing, about three and a half degrees Celsius or about 38 degrees Fahrenheit for those of you who are still hanging on to the non scientific measurement system. <laughs> uh, so the 20 gallon aquarium has to be encased in styrofoam. Uh, foam board, so that has to be all made. Um, I had to bribe my husband to help, but after he finished making the tank cover, the uh, a representative from the Salmon Association came up and said he had never seen one so beautifully done. So <laughs> he did a good job. It had to be retrofitted to allow for the tank. Um, we add 20 gallons of water, and then you have to keep water on hand just in case there's an emergency. And so this is what the setup looks like. And uh, I got a little fancy with mine. I got a little temperature probe. So I had three, three thermometers in there because I didn't trust any of them. I had, I had uh, one at the top, one at the bottom, the old-fashioned kind, and then I had a computer monitor, um, which would take a temperature reading every 30 minutes. And my daughter's here. She can attest to how I came up here. <laughs> Oh, probably a couple times a day for that first couple of months. <laughs> Kept peeking in the lid to make sure they were all right, and they were all right. Um, and here's the chiller. The chiller unit kicks on and off. It's pretty loud in the classroom, but it does keep that tank at a relatively constant between three and four degrees Celsius, which is the native habitat of the um, Just a little temperature monitoring. So it would be reviewed out and uh, let me know what's going on. So if I couldn't get here five times a day, I would have the computer print out to make me feel better. <laughs> uh, this is what the inside of the tank looks like. You can see the chiller coils in here, gravel bottom. I wanted to put gravel on the whole bottom, and the guy from the Connecticut River Salmon Association said, you do realize that you're going to have to take out all that gravel before you take the eggs out, so don't put a lot in there. <laughs> um, I've been told that they're thigmotrophic, meaning they need to kind of touch up against something, and when you see the eggs in there, they do kind of huddle together. Hmm. So this is an example of what they look like at the hatchery, and they're screened for health, and once those eggs turn a dark opaque color, they've probably died, so usually they try to take many of those out before they're delivered. So when we get our delivery, this is our last delivery we got last year, they all look nice and healthy. We're told we're supposed to get about 200, but I need to call the hatchery because we've only gotten about 180 each time, so they're shorting us a few <laughs> So that was disappointing. So this is what it looks like inside the aquarium. And I took most of these pictures with my iPhone, nothing fancy. And thankfully, I didn't drop it in there. And now I have a life proof case. But uh, here's the eggs in, nestled in here. And here's my temperature probe down so I can keep, keep track of the temperature. Uh, temperature is really important. Of course, it is their native. You want to keep it as close to the native habitat as possible. But the other thing that's really key is that the rate of growth and development is controlled by temperature. So if the temperature is too warm, um, the fish or the eggs are going to incubate faster. If it's too cold, it's going to incubate slower. You need to time it just right so you can get those permission slips for those kids to go out on release day <laughs> and make sure that by the time you are ready to release, they are almost at 100% development, um, but not quite. So they still need to have a little bit of that sack left. But if they develop too quickly and you have to release them April 1st, that's too early in most streams and they're not going to make it. So it, you really have to be able I'm joking about the temperature. You really do need to be very conscious of it. Okay, so this is what they look like when they come out of the egg. 
which is pretty cool. And um, you can see that the A and B eyes there, okay? And they're just coming out. Um, here, they're just looking into the bottom of the tank, various stages of hatching. This is what they look like. Those are the, would be the, uh, call them early sac fry or, or, or alligans, and you can see this yolk sac. And they're, they're alive. I just put them in a little styrofoam cup so I could take the picture when I put them back. <laughs> okay. Um, I did have an uh, embedded video, but it's not going to play, unfortunately. But I will upload this, uh, this PowerPoint to my website so anybody can view it if they want. And um, you can see in the bottom here, they're kind of all nestled together. And here, that's about, so you'll see this note here, 75 or 65% DI. That's the developmental index we track each day where they are up to 100%. You want to release them when they're at about 95%. Uh, this is right before release day. You can see they're darker in color now. You can see the sacs are a lot smaller. Just note these um, these dark these uh, white spots here. They were a problem. That, that was a problem for us this year. Okay. So ready to release. We release them. Uh, I think May first or May second. And uh, farming to over at People State Forest. Perfect habitat. Rocky bottom. Lots of camouflage. Um, cold water. Clean. And uh, just picture the watershed here. So we release up in here. Obviously, the farm can the watershed, but then it's into the Connecticut. And the fish can get all the way down to Connecticut, all the way out into Long Island Sound, if they all make it, or any of them make it. So packing up for transport, thank you, Alana and Harold. Uh, take them in a cooler so they stay at a relatively constant temperature. Uh, field trip, saying goodbye at the river. Um, <laughs> um, you can see the good rocky bottom there. And while we're there, we do a lot of uh, other educational things, obviously making observations of the habitat, not just where the fish are being released, but it, pr it provides for a really good science day to uh, tie in a whole bunch of concepts. Um, I do another activity with the kids. We do another activity with the kids where they are modeling what it's like to kind of smell your way home, so kind of think about the imprinting. Um, so it's a, another fun game that we play. We do a predator-prey activity, so we're trying to model what it would be like and look at population fluctuations, which is uh, what happens with the, with the salmon too, okay? Uh, some surprises, unplanned things, uh, things nature is not perfect, so there's always learning opportunities. Sometimes there are problems with the eggs. Two years ago, our first one, this guy here, mm -hmm. um, had a deformed spine. He did make it, or she, to Hatch Day, and the, the kids named him Nemo. Uh, didn't swim very well, but was still alive when we released it. Two heads are not better than one. Uh, this was a two-headed salmon, um, which lived a couple weeks, and uh, unfortunately that one did not make it. It's pretty common, I hear. They usually get a couple of them every year in some of the tanks. Uh, this one, the tail came out, the rest of it did not, uh, didn't make it. Um, fungus. Last year we had a problem with fungus in our tank and I kept noticing that, that some of the eggs looked like they were rupturing and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So it was kind of good to peek in the tank every couple days because I tried to stay ahead of it. The fungus can spread very quickly and wipe out the entire population in your tank so I kept pulling out the dead eggs, pulling out the dead eggs as best I could. Um, and we managed to actually still have a pretty good release of, of uh, we only lost 14 out of our 175 that we got. <laughs> this one was consumed by the fungus, didn't make it. But again, just trying to keep ahead of it, I kept pulling them out. And uh, so, so it all worked out. Hopefully not a problem this year. So the, the, real, the real educational point of all this with the kids in addition to understanding the history of salmon and for those you know, who are fishermen or whatever, is, is trying to connect the dots. You know, we are all the way up here in Heartland. What, why do we need to worry about our watersheds? Why do we need to worry about the Farmington River, the Connecticut River, Long Island Sound? It's all connected. It's all connected. And so the point that we try to make, we impress, impress upon the kids, is that things that we do up here, even in your own backyard, the amount of fertilizer you use, whether you're uh, disturbing the soil, it all impacts our watersheds and our water bodies. And so the kids can really see uh, where we are here, where we're releasing things, what can end up flowing into the Connecticut River eventually. The salmon need to make their way all the way down there, all the way out into Long Island Sound, and then hopefully all the way back. 
And so everything we do here dumps into the sound, which is one of our most precious resources here in Connecticut. So trying to get the kids to understand that is, is really, really important. Um, after we release the sound in May, we have another field trip with the sixth grade where we go to Long Island Sound and we um, go out to Project Oceanology on a boat and look at the saltwater species. And so the kids then are able to see, aha, you know, this is where our salmon need to get to and beyond. So this allows them to connect the dots. So love the program. I love the support of the community. Um, and thank you to everybody who supported us, the Land Trust, the Connecticut River Sound Association, Farmington River Coordinating Committee, thank you very much this year, and of course the board and the PTO. Evan. The eggs? Yeah. Good question. I kind of zoomed over that part. Um, there's a hatchery in Kensington that supplies the eggs. So that's, I think that's the only one in Connecticut, right? Mm -hmm. There's only one hatchery left, and so they bring it to all the schools. So they actually capture adult salmon, and they get the eggs from adult salmon, and then they deliver them to all the different schools. Okay. okay? Good question. What's the thinking on why the salmon just start coming back? Um, Do we have any sense of that at all? Or, I mean, people must have at least thought about it. I read a lot of things, heard a lot of people talk about it. Steve Gephardt talked about it. Climate, water temperature, environment, a lot of factors. Uh, a lot of it possibly is from climate change. Striped bass. Striped bass? Mm -hmm. They're the predators. <laughs> uh, but that's a big factor. The water cleanliness, gravel, stuff like that seems like it should theoretically be hospitable in the system working. It's just not working. They have been, they've been going on for 20 something, 20 something years, and the numbers are still just terribly low. The biggest returning salmon, I think, is around 500. That is not the records. So, uh, just a couple of quick things because I know it's late. If you are um, looking to help out the program, there are membership forms for the Connecticut River Salmon Association on the table there. Um, and so there's also some newsletters if you want to pick up a newsletter or go to their website. And I will post this PowerPoint because I zoomed through it on my website, uh, which you can get to through the Heartland School or, or the Land Trust. And uh, I've maintained a, a website that will has the last two programs of salmon and I would just upload pictures. It's just a blog which talks about the success of the program. So I'll put that on if anybody's interested. Okay. Thank you very much.